Well, um, I would like to introduce Monda. So today we're going to do introduction to machine learning, um, or as most in statistical data mining uh, approaches to data analysis, or as known in a lot of by a lot of ecologists, fishing expeditions. So we're going to talk about a principal way of doing fishing ex expeditions. And to introduce us to machine learning and data mining is Monda, Raimonda uh, Carceres is a, a graduate student here in the department. So she is a PhD student, actually my PhD student, one of mine. And Monda, uh, Monda's research is in machine learning and statistical data mining, so who better than her? Monda also was a student in the previous iteration of the Kenya course, and uh, uh, so she used her statistical data mining and machine learning knowledge and expertise to for the project that she did in the course, which was, she'll talk more about it, and um, you guys all, Princeton guys, you all know R from what I understand, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah they're yes. not nodding. Yes. Okay. It's kind of, uh, today, because of the setup, it's a little bit hard to see when you nod. So if you, yeah, so if you can vocalize your uh, ascent or descent, that would be great. <laughs> so... <Okay. laughs> Happy, sad, you know, all of that kind of thing. So I'll leave uh, you guys in Monda's hands. Okay, so hi everyone, uh, especially hi to the Princeton students. Um, thank you, Tanya, for inviting me. Well, Tanya likes to say that I'm an expert on this, but you know, that's, that's a, an exaggeration. I do have experience with some of the methods that I will present, and I will emphasize um, some insights that came from using those methods in general in my research, but specifically in the Kenya course, and what I learned specifically about using those methods. So, um, also please interrupt me. Feel free to interrupt me. It's, it's very informal. Um, just a student, just like you. So, you know, just interrupt whenever you have a question or you have a comment. Okay. So. I want to go a little bit about, uh, uh, explain a little bit about uh, the reasons why we want to use R. And um, R represents an environment that we can do almost uh, from beginning to end the da data analysis process. We can pre-process, we can clean the data, we can remove outliers, we can uh, remove missing uh, values. So we can deal with data quality issues. We can perform data uh, exploration uh, tasks, visualize, get some feel about uh, the data, do some <coughs> simple summary statistics. We could also do data analysis and interpretation under everything under one umbrella. So it's a nice environment for that reason. Also, it's it's um, to my knowledge an environment that has a, a comprehensive list of machine learning methods. I have yet to encounter another such environment that would contain such a diverse list of machine learning methods all in one. And um, it interfaces well with a lot of other platforms uh, from Excel to Java, Python. I personally do scripting in Python and I call R to do, to, to call different methods through R and then go back to Python and that's the way I interact with it. But you know, Java is also another environment uh, also, uh, Excel for the ecologists, I know that that's uh, a software that they use a lot for analysis. That's, uh, the interface is also straightforward there too. And finally, it's free, and for us in education, that's a nice feature, right? And so, um, why machine learning? Uh, well, nowadays we have a lot of collecting data is very easy. Just one example. When I was in the Kenya course, one of the projects that I worked on was uh, reporting the movement of sheep. And we collected data at a resolution of five seconds. And uh, we did this. Tanya is pointing. My voice? No, the GPS. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we uh, put GPSs on sheep and we recorded their movements. Um, uh, we 
had about 13 sheep and we recorded their movement about um, 13 to 14 days. So if you record every five seconds, you know, you can imagine that you're collecting a massive amount of data. And how do you process that? How do you analyze that? And uh, traditional statistical methods will collapse, you know, to, when analyzing such massive data sets. And that's where machine learning comes up to the challenge and offers alternative with dealing with such massive data sets. Another aspect is... Sorry? Uh, Jacob, asked, Jacob asked, what do you mean by collapse? Uh, a lot of regular, um, sort of the old statistical methods, they uh, operate on, let's say, a hundred observations is like a normal big data set, and they are not designed to handle million of observations, or you know, those are the magnitude of data that we're actually looking at and analyzing. That's what I mean. Cool. Sorry, I keep looking that way because I think I'm going to make a visual connection, but I know I'm not doing that, so I, I don't mean to. I'll, Hopefully, by the end, I'll get used to looking at the camera. Okay. So the other aspect is that uh, the data is very complex in terms of the number of features that we're analyzing. Um, uh, another example, another project that I was involved on is looking, analyzing um, behavior of weaver birds in Kenya. We were trying to understand how they decided where they would position their nests. So we collected data about the characteristics of the species. We collected data about the characteristics of the tree, about the characteristics of the nest itself. So we had about 20 to 25 features that we collected per weaver, or the weaver was like, think of it as an observation, per bird. And you know, it, 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 it's naturally a, a very multi-dimensional space. How do you even begin to analyze such a, such a data set? And again, machine learning has methods and uh, that deal with multi-dimensional data sets. And last, and I think it's really important, is that this machine learning presents a new modeling, um, uh, a new modeling model, a new um, um, analysis model. Before, it used to be that the data analyst had a hypothesis about the data, and then tested the hypothesis with the data. Now it's the, the process has switched. We use the data to generate hypotheses. Oftentimes the data is so big and complex that we don't know what's the right model that describes it, but we can use the data to generate those hypotheses and then it's sort of a circular motion and then we go and refine our analysis, use our input as expert in the field, and then refine the process. But so, so the process has switched. Data serves as a hypothesis generation source and also as a verification source. We can also uh, use it to validate that our methods are correct and do indeed uh, perform as they should. <coughs> okay. um, so the matrix I'm presenting here is kind of like the way the data input is going to look like um, when we call a method from machine learning class. So we have the columns here representing the features that we have um, collected, and the rows represent observations. Like I mentioned, the Weaver data set, the columns will be characteristics of the tree, the, spe of the species of the bird, and so on, and the observations will be the birds. Right? And what kind of questions can we ask? One kind of question would be, um, what are some of the most important features that determine where the, the bird will position its nest? What are the most critical features that would deter determine that? So that kind of question, which is a question that an ecologist has, can be translated into this class of methods that we call the feature selection methods or the projection methods. Mm -hmm. Yes? The ecologists are probably asking the question, not what are the important ones, but why are they important? Okay. But to get to that, you need to know which ones are important. Okay. What was the question? Tyler? Yeah. 
Tanya is saying that the uh, ecologists, the main question that they're asking, why are certain features important? But to get to that answer, we first must answer what are the important uh, features. So that was a correction. Another kind of question that we can ask is, are there individuals in the population that we are observing, are there similar individuals? Are there certain types of individual. For example, in the case of the sheep data set, uh, there were two kind of two types. There were the, the leaders, the guys that determined where the sheep would graze or when they would rest, and there were the followers. So we would like to classify or group the observations based on these types. So that's those kind of questions can be answered under this by using methods that fall in this category that's called the partitioning, um, the partitioning methods. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about, under the feature selection category, I'll talk about both linear and nonlinear methods. And for the partition methods, I'll discuss tree-based methods and clustering methods. Okay. And I'll start with the um, the principal component analysis. This is a sort of the simplest. I, I know the, uh, the college students have already a lot of um, knowledge about this. At least that was the that was the experience with um, the course that I was in in Kenya. Uh, they were very knowledgeable. They were using this. This is a common tool to use as a first uh, as a first step. And so what it basically does, this method tries to reduce the dimensionality of the feature space. But the ultimate goal is to preserve as much as possible the variation in the data. So we go from this original matrix that has n dimensions to a much smaller matrix with d dimensions. And I think a good example here perhaps would be an example from visualization. And maybe the, the visualization group can help me here. Um, so for, for example, face recognition. Describing the contour of the face, there's a lot of variables that you describe that contour, but actually you can do the face recognition with very few measures. You don't need all of those, all the pixels that describe the contour of the face. You need, and usually I think it's three or four, you know, it's like a classic example of the reduction that is inherent that, that the data allows you to do. Right? So they're, they're nodding, so they're, so they're agreeing with me. But in general, we could take advantage of redundancies in the feature space. There's subsets of features that we have collected that they are related and they are sort of telling something latent, inherent about the data. For example, in the case of the Weaver data set, uh, perhaps uh, measuring the canopy of the tree or the height of the tree, those are characteristics of the architecture of the tree. They don't uh, individually give us something unique about un any unique information. It's more important, for example, that the tree is big. They characterize this element of the car ar architecture of the tree and that affects how the birds will position their nest in the tree. So these latent variables, these higher characteristics, we, we call them principal components, and we want to be able to identify them. One, we can reduce the complexity of the data from simply computational perspective. And second, it, it's also um, a modeling benefit, right, because we understand this underlying patterns about the data, higher level patterns about the data. And, yes? So here you are selecting D features among the N features, or you're aggregating the N features into D features using some other, just, you're just selecting D out of N, or? No, the, the process is a little bit more involved than that. Um, I will explain, in the, for example, I, 
Well, let me explain a little bit more and then we'll get okay. it back again. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And then another thing I want to emphasize here is that the general question that we want to ask is what are the important features? But notice that the definition of this method says what are the important features with respect to the variance that preserves the variance. So we already instantiated the word important and then replaced it by important are those that preserve the variance. And it's an assumption that it's important to realize or to understand or to keep in mind. Because the notion of importance can be instantiated in many ways. It's, a, it's in general a very ill-defined notion. And in this context, it, it has been instantiated in terms of variance. Intuitively, you'd want to keep those dimensions in the feature space that where there's more variations because you're thinking that's where interesting things are happening. But it doesn't need to be true in all the cases about your data. So it's an important assumption to keep in mind where you're applying the principle of component analysis method. So here's the simplest case of this uh, method, the linear PCA. And here the assumption is that, well, yes. yes. Sorry, uh, to back up. With this assumption that you know, it preserves a, a variance, right? It's most informative in, 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 in a sense uh, for, for something from the point of view of variance. So then how does it transcend into variables that are, say, binary? Right. Categorical? Categorical in general, but even more so when you only have to, to um, the notion of variance is, is not directly translated, the, does not directly translate, right? So, so that's, it's, it's a huge about, assumption for those. I'll talk about You'll it. You'll talk about it. Yeah, I'll talk about it. Okay. So, in the simplest case, the linear PCA, the assumption is that these new latent variables can be expressed as a linear combination of existing variables. If we have some knowledge from linear algebra, we're trying to find the basis of this feature space. We're trying to remove any redundancies and find a basis that explains the what's important about this data set. And here, I'm illustrating here, notice we have a, um, a data cloud. Those are our observations embedded in 3D space. And it's embedded in a 3D space, but you can see that actually you could, it's a plane embedded in 3D space. And you don't lose any information if you just look at it at the 2D space, right? The third dimension is almost, it, not almost, it's not needed there to represent the data. And also, look at the variation of the data. Uh, what the method is going to do is it's going to pick that dimension along which you have most of the variance. And that is um, what's called PC1 in the, in the plot, in the picture. And then the next thing it's going to do is going to look for the orthogonal direction that has the next most variance, that explains the next most variance for the data. Okay. And so the implicit assumptions here are that there is linearity in the relation between the higher, the latent variables and the original variables. And there's sort of this orthogonal uh, projections of the data. And again, it's important to understand the implications of those assumptions. You know, because as we will see, real data usually are, the linearity assumption is often violated. And um, you have much more complex relationships, nonlinear relationships. And the orthogonality, this orthogonal projection is not going to help retrieve the right um, projection plane for, for the feature space. Okay, but I think we're ready to do some demonstration in R. We all have R. I can switch here. And I'm going to demonstrate with the simplest data set. Yeah? What happened? Wait, but I need to do 
by you watching the R, they cannot... You should make uh, the screen mirroring, yeah, you should enable mirroring. What should I do? Close While they're setting up, I want to point out that this is the, the position that Kerry spent most of his last time in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> helping others, you know, figuring out how to do stuff. So Kerry also was uh, in the previous iteration of the course, and uh, he's a, he can be very helpful. <laughs> you can see Kerry is from, uh, from the visualization lab. Who to go to ask their questions? Alright. I don't know if it's only me, but you can raise the size of the font from there. Is that possible? <laughs> Make the font bigger? Yeah. Yeah, you can do it. You can do a comment plus in the R window if you want. In the R window? Yeah, R you can go in the R editor and do a comment plus. plus. And you have format. Or you can just do it. Yeah. Better? Maybe a little more. Probably it's only the. Uh, Even more. At that vision sometimes. <coughs> yeah. I get closer. Well, that's the first thing that I think. <laughs> Does it look okay over there? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to illustrate with a very simple data set, and then we'll, we'll get messy with other data sets. Okay, but just to illustrate, I'm, I'll use the Irish data set. The Irish data set has observations for three kind of flowers, and um, well, let me load it. Do, you, do we know the, the, the data set? It's built in an R. Okay, so. So, or let me do say names. I want to see what are the features in the data set. So we have the simple length, the width, the pedal length, and the pedal width. And we also have three categories um, for the species. bottom level, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Those are the three types of flowers for the iris data set. Okay. 
Can so, you make the window a little bit bigger? Or can you make this the full? The R window? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and also increase the font just for yeah. the two options. I'm getting the others in very close. <laughs> more? Um, yeah, maybe one more. Better? Okay. One more notch. One more. Okay. Another thing, another thing to do, um, so you don't have to you don't have to type every time iris dollar sign species, you could attach the data set. Or I don't Okay. So I'm gonna create a new data set just with the measures describing the, the flowers. So we'll do So this is my new data set. And right now I'm going to run the linear PCA, which is PR. That's the method. And I'm going to pass in my data. And one important parameter, and it's very critical, and I found this out the hard way, you need to scale the data. Maybe not critical in this case, but for real data set is really critical. What happened in Kenya, we had measurements of nests in inches and measurements of the tree height in feet, and you need to scale it there in different dimensions, otherwise your results are going to be totally wrong because of that. So that's that scale equals true that handles that. It normalizes the data. And I'm going to store this. <laughs> So what does that object So let me actually try to plot and then that would be more descriptive than this looking at this matrix of numbers. So I'm going to say uh, screen plot. <laughs> So what we're looking here is we're seeing each color represents the new dimension, the new principal component, and the height represents the percent variance explained in the data. So what we really want is to pick the, the dimensions that uh, preserve most of the variance. So in this case, I think just keeping even keeping the first dimension of being enough, perhaps um, the second as well, but definitely we don't need to keep the last two. Okay, so we started with four dimension, four measures, and what this analysis tells us is that you could describe um, the data actually in two-dimensional space. You don't need four dimensions to describe the data, the variance of the data. Okay, and um, let's look at. We can still see the screen there. That matrix gives the importance that the variable has. Let's look at sequel length, for example. The value 0 0.5 to 1 and so on gives the importance that variable plays along that dimension. So what do we notice here? That And by the way, the minus doesn't matter. It just means direction. It's, negative. it's, it's the correlation, in other words. Um, so 
we can see that if you compare the four features, sepal width perhaps is not very useful because it has very small correlation or influence along that dimension. And by dimension, I mean, I mean the column PC1. Okay, and then we can repeat the analysis along the columns and sort of understand. We said that we can drop PC3 and PC4, they're not useful. So we can say, okay, so simple width is not that important. And in terms of the second dimension, well, it seems that the most important variable is simple width, right? And that's, it, actually, this is perfect. That's what we actually want, that there's something new that this feature tells us, but it doesn't, how should I say this? And let me, let me, uh, uh, try to rephrase it. We notice that the same feature is not important in one dimension, but it's important in other dimensions, which makes sense. Those dimensions are orthogonal. They tell us different things about the data. We actually want that to happen. In the case where the same features becomes important in multiple dimensions, that's actually a criteria for dropping that feature. We want a discriminating feature. we do here, we can do a biplot of the two dimensions, so PCA. So, um, one second, yeah. I have a question, back to this. So the first column says it's essentially the length with, uh, the, the sequel length and pedal width and pedal length are all playing into, in equal parts essentially to the first component, right? Mm -hmm. And the sequel, sequel width essentially tells us something very different for from the other th from the other three. Right. But the first component is just a combination, right, of the first of, the of those three in equal parts. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's some some function of, of all of that, mm -hmm. which is the most discriminating, the explained most of the variable. So, but we really don't know what function, and even biologically, we really don't know what exactly about those three features that that that, that describes. So let's why why don't we know? Yeah. Hmm? Is there a question? Yeah, I'm just asking why don't we know what function? I mean why is this function just exactly that linear combination that we have that we can read off the column PC one? Right. Those those values are the coefficients, the A one. But but I think what Tanya is saying is uh, how should we interpret this? What is, what should we call this new PC1? What, what does it say about the data? I think that's what you're trying yeah, to say, yeah. right? Because let's say if it was only simple length and, or if you want, it was only the pedal characteristics, then we would say we can discriminate mm -hmm. between the flowers just by looking at the characteristics of the pedal, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not immediately obvious because somehow simple length plays a role. But there must be some latent feature that is not straightforward to interpret where the three of them say, you know, they describe that latent feature. And right, so pedal width, for example, if pedal width and pedal length both were in equal parts playing into a component, you can say that it may be the, the area, right? So it doesn't matter whether it's long and skinny or short and, and fat, it's just it's the, it's the area or the whatever, um, or, or the perimeter of the pedal. But so now you have three features that essentially are, are playing in, in, in equal parts. So it's somehow the perimeter of the, the total perimeter of the pedals, the perimeter of the pedals and the, the, the sepal length. That, that 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 equally play. So it's you can't say that you know short sepal is different from long sepal because it's short sepal in combination with the pedal geometry yeah. that 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 has a meaning. So uh, right. So the interpretation this only poses some hypothesis. It tells right. you you know this is this is the function that discriminates in terms of the uh, variance. But what it means is 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 up to you guys, the biologists. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. The interpretation is not always easy, and sort of it's not like a magic bullet. It, you know, like Tanya said, I don't want to repeat. You know, just present the possible hypothesis, but then from then on, then 
we have to use some knowledge about the data to 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 be able to interpret it further. Okay, so let's look at the projection of the data in this two-dimensional space. So the x-axis is the first component, the y-axis is the second component. I mean, the most obvious thing that when I see this plot is that you see the two clusters of the data, right? There is clustering of the data there. And, and notice that the sepal length is the most important variable. Let, let's go back to the values. The, the coefficients. The sepal length is the most important variable along the, 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 the first principal component direction. And notice how the pedal length and the pedal width, they're almost parallel. So they're essentially along the same dimension. Excuse me. Yeah. Why do you say that the sepal length is more important? It seems to me that the pedal length would be more. How do you how do you determine that? Well, I, I'm thinking of, for example, of, of uh, putting a, a line uh, uh, of constant the sepal length. Uh, that line would, would the cross. length of the vector, or are you looking at the length which which does? I'm come looking at the vector. Mm -hmm. I, I'm looking at the vector, and I think, okay, let's try to put a, a separation line at a given value of sepal length. That line would be perpendicular to the vector, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, Camila, I didn't understand the question. I would say, basically, why is sepal length more important than pedal length? Well, so notice the, the most variation that it happens along the, the PC1, right? That, and then look at the value of the correlation it's 0 0.58. I know there's not such a big difference, differentiation between that and the other two, but the higher that value, the more so important it is. So it's the pedal length that is the most important. Right. That's oh, okay. I thought you said sepal. No. Okay. Perhaps my eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah. Okay. Wait, what? Does pedal length or sepal length? That's it. Got it. Yeah. I think you need to restate the importance of the components because there's also confusion there. I, I didn't hear that. You need to restate which components are important and what plays into what because they, there's a confusion there as well. Okay, so the x-axis represents the first component and notice the important features there. Pedal length, sepal length, and pedal width. Pedal length, sepal length, and pedal width. So those are the most parallel with the x-axis, right? And notice the sepal width is parallel with the y-axis, which is the second dimension. Okay? So we were, we didn't hear, we were wondering, was it pedal length or sepal length that you were saying was most important that looks like pedaling to us for PC1? For PC1, is pedal length, pedal width, okay. and sepal length. So notice the angle between those vectors is the smallest, and they're almost parallel with the x-axis. But what's, what's the one that you said had the most explanatory power? Because we were looking at the numbers, and it seems that petal length explains most of the variation. Is that what you were saying, or were you saying right. sepal length? Right. Okay, we misheard you. It sounded like sepal length over here. Okay, thanks. The, 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 um, yeah, the people the here have the same problem. I you did say sepal you missed, from missed. I, I did? Okay. Yeah. It's okay. So, but just it's, to, to clarify it's the out of body experience we're presenting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just some simple uh, illustration for the PCA method. Should we go back now to talking a little bit more about other methods? Right? Yeah, just yeah. one question. Yeah. Uh, these uh, principal components are. I remember the other are then the eigenvectors of the yes. observation matrix. Yes, yes. Okay. It's the observation matrix. You from that you compute the correlation matrix, which embeds that matrix in um, Euclidean space, mm -hmm. and then you do the SVD decomposition, and then you pick the top eigenvectors 
to be so, here. So yeah. right. So as such, you, you actually make an assumption that you can use standard correlation to to embed the, the Oh thing. yeah. I mean, there's assumptions along basically every step of the of the abstraction for the method. And, and you know. Uh, yes. Um, you mentioned before that if one of those features was um, high in each one of those um, in PC1 and PC2, that wouldn't be as significant? Or as yeah, because we're looking for discriminatory features, right? We're looking, if it, if it happens in all of them, then it doesn't help us discriminate one dimension from the other. And also, from the linear uh, algebra perspective, you know, you want things that are orthogonal and sort of independent of each other. Because you're removing the dependency and you end up with a basis of that space where everything tells you something unique. So if that feature is in all of them, it doesn't tell you anything unique. So it's automatically a criteria for disqualifying that feature. It's actually one of them. There's a lot of criteria, but that's one of them. But this is sort of a clean case where you have a complement situation. It happens in one with a high correlation but small correlation with that. Can I ask another yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Sorry about So uh, Going back to my previous question about D and N, the D dimensions with respect to the N dimensions of the original observation metrics. Now, if you observe these uh, physical component metrics, should we, what do we consider as those D dimensions? The two PC1 and PC2? Yes. Or yes. the two features which are the most important with respect to those two No, components? It's, it's the number of dimensions. And in each dimension, you could have multiple features. As it's the case here, Which PC1 is has three. It's okay. three so important. those these would be linear combinations of features because we're do, we're doing linear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's switch back to. Um, Great. But um, one more thing back to the plot. <laughs> no. Okay. okay. Uh, so one one thing here is. The, the one of the indicators, so yeah, you have these three features, you write sepal length, fetal length, uh, pedal length, ah. and uh, pedal width. But, and they all, this, they all seem equally important, but the reason, so the next question should be, uh, you know, they're, they're probably not independent of each other. So if the pedal length, for example, and pedal width are very highly correlated, then it's essentially you're looking twice at more or less the same variable. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. That when we're collecting data, as you know, to to answer a question, if we have some understanding of certain <coughs> measures, depending on others, it's best not to introduce them in our analysis because they will throw off off our analysis. Sometimes we don't know, and that's why we do this kind of analysis. But we, if we have some knowledge that you know one measure is going to introduce a, uh, a dependence on the other, then we should not include them because exactly what Tanya is saying, it, it might not be that they're saying something essential about the data, but maybe there is a linear dependence there that is throwing off the analysis. That had it not been there, one of those two measures, perhaps we would get a much cleaner sort of two sets of categories, latent variables, much cleaner separation between the two dimensions. So, let me go back. I'll, I'll post this uh, presentation online so you'll have the comments there. Now, I just presented a simple AO. Let me, sorry. Um, I just presented a simple case where we had this nice drop in the percent variance explained uh, in terms of the d new dimensions. Um, and that's always nice when it happens because we don't have to worry so much how many new dimensions should we keep, you know, but in practice that's not always the case. And this is a plot that is generated by real data. This is the Weaver data collected in Kenya. And this is, we, we ran the PCA method on the data and we're trying to determine how many components should I keep. 
So the y-axis represents the percent variance explained. And I already, um, so it's not this sharp decrease. Should I keep two? Should I keep four? Should I keep six, eight, all? So it's not always straightforward to decrease that. And I'll talk a little bit briefly how you do that, but I want to sort of put a disclaimer next to it and say it becomes more sort of art than precise science. Okay. And one criteria we already mentioned, you sort of uh, eliminate those dimensions that have measures in them happening all over the place. We were looking for uniqueness, clean separations. So you remove those features from your analysis and you rerun the analysis to get a, a cleaner separation. Um, other things that you're looking for is you want a feature to at least contribute 1% of the standard deviation, at least if, um, yes? Not 1%, one full standard. Yeah, one standard, uh, at least to introduce one dimension. If it's saying that it's uh, introducing 0 0.4, it's not even able to explain itself. You know, it, it's, it's um, you want uh, the, the percent variance explained by the, um, the dimension to be at least <coughs> 10% or, or, or one um, standard deviation. So, also... <clears throat> so I, I didn't quite follow that last part. Yeah, it's because I didn't do a good job one, explaining. One, <laughs> one standard deviation of what? So, think of each... Um, think of each measure originally present um, introducing one standard deviation represent I mean, perhaps that's not the best way to explain it um, so each variable right explains each component explains variance right in that direction <laughs> right. so it's normalized how much of the variance it, these numbers show how much of the variance in that direction does it explain right. it's normalized to one so so each 10%, each point yes, one no, is no. one standard deviation no. of the variance in that dimension. Right. So if you have a uh, measure that re uh, represents less, but clearly you don't want that. If you have a dimension that represents less, you don't want that. Less than 10 So Less than 10%. So if you have a variable that only explains point one of the variance in that dimension, point one is one standard deviation. So it explains less than one standard deviation of the variance in that dimension. So you, it really is not even explaining one standard deviation worth of the variance mm -hmm. in that dimension. So it's not very explanatory. Very explanatory. Uh, I, guess, I guess what I don't understand is I don't, I don't understand what the meaning of standard deviation is in the context of a multi-dimensional data set. Well, the, the data set you know, in n dimensions, doesn't have a standard deviation except along particular linear projections of the data set, unless there's no generalizable ability of standard deviation that I'm not familiar with. And that's my question. So, so we're measuring we're measuring the standard deviation along the projection. You know, if we right. to, to project along the um, one certain dimension, we can measure dispersion of the data cloud along that dimension. And the standard right, deviation. But, but so then, so then my question is, how can um, any uh, any linear projection of the data possibly fail to encapsulate all of the variance that can be projected onto that line? Because the data is explained as a linear combination of several measures along that dimension. We're talking about this higher dimension. We're not talking about the dimension represented by each individual feature. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a, con uh, so I know, I don't know if that's the source of the confusion, but there are two methods that are called PCA. One is principal coordinate analysis, the other one is principal component analysis. So we're talking about principal component analysis, which right. is each dimension here, each component, is a linear combination of the variables. So you, you draw a line in your multidimensional space and you project the entire, in the entire data set onto that line. Now you can me measure, measure variance along that line, right? right. So that variance has standard deviations, uh -huh. right? 
how much right. each variable explains of that variance, that's exactly the numbers you're seeing in the principal component analysis. So they're normalized to have 0.1 is one standard deviation. That's and so we're doing this to eliminate variables. Okay. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So now what what was could you just restate the criterion for how to decide whether to keep a particular component or not? So at the minimum each feature should um, contribute one standard deviation to the variance. So if that uh -huh. doesn't so happen, if, say if there's any feature of the original data set, any variable that does not, for which the principal component doesn't um, um, have at least 0.1 times that variable as part of its uh, part of its direction, that you shouldn't keep the principal component. That you we shouldn't keep that component. You shouldn't keep that variable. You should drop it from the analysis. Ah, I find that understand. So we're not anymore asking how many of our principal components will we keep. We're trying to just take out variables from the initial set of variables based on whether they contribute to the principal components or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that, that was what I was confused about. I thought that we were talking about dropping principal components rather than dropping variables that were features of the data set before we ran the analysis. And, um, right. And, and to continue here, I, I, uh, I didn't notice, and this is something that I learned during this course, apparently uh, in the data analysis, sort of in the ecological data analysis, getting a variance, a total variance explained about 40 to 50 percent was good news. And, and, and I was shocked when I saw that value. I was expecting for us like 80 percent. We should be able to explain 80 percent of the data. And I had my um, my colleagues my uh, from Princeton telling me, yes, this is perfect. 40, 50 percent. That's what we usually get. So don't worry. We we're, we're doing this right. So, but in general, you want to at least have. 50%, 60% of the data explained, then you use that as a criteria to drop the rest. So in this case, we want perhaps to to take the first component explains about 20%, the second one about 15%, we need to add more, the third. So perhaps four components would be the right number of components for this data. But like I said, this is not concise science. This Excuse what me. We, yeah. So we are back to, to, to dropping components. Yeah. Right. Right. So, but from before you were defining the contribution of, of variables to variables. So, I, I think the point that I was trying to make here is that when we see that a variable is performing badly, mm -hmm. then uh, the recommendation is to remove that variable from the analysis and rerun it. So you can get a better view, a better separation. So that, that when there is something obvious that a variable is, is showing up at all the dimensions, is performing, is contributing very little, mm -hmm. then the recommendation is to remove it and not continue with the analysis with that variable. Okay, and that will give us different principal components. And and that will give you and then perhaps refine and then you would expect okay. a sharper. Uh, I see. Now I went back to saying if that's not obvious to do, maybe look at total percent variance among components and say, well, we want, I don't know what is good. And this is where interpretation, this is where knowledge expertise comes to play. Like I said, I saw 40% for our data, and they said, we don't have a model. And then the ecology student said, well, no, this is normal. You know, So that science had nothing to do there. It was not the knowledge expertise that came into play. I don't know. Math has nothing to do with it. It's the science that Well, yeah. the art, the art. <laughs> yeah. The art part. Yeah. So after you've removed all the variables that are not contributing anything useful, mm -hmm. um, and you're left with just the things that the variables that are informative, now you're starting, so you can't remove any more variables. And you're, then we still have this problem. Right, you start so now you're starting to figure out how many components you should have. You you should should keep. Keep. If, if it's still the problem that you don't have a sharp decrease, sharp decrease, then you say, 
well, let's keep, you know, as many components as, so that they can explain at least 50, 60 percent of the variance. We do things like that. Um, I have searched a lot about this. I was obsessed with making this precise, and I found a very good document. I'll post it. It's a good document if you're going to run PC analysis with your data. It goes over the different criteria. Everything is collapsed into the document. I found it really useful, and I'll add it to the references so you guys could refer to it for interpretation um, need, if you have interpretation needs. Okay. The other, uh, so, so we're talking about issues with real data, right? I talked about the IRIS data set. It was nice and clean, and here is already we're facing interpretation issues with real data. The other issue that we have is that we had mixed type uh, data types. We had qualitative and quantitative data. And the PCA analysis, like Tanya mentioned, makes the assumption that you have uh, numerical data, you have, not numerical, quantitative data, okay. integral data. Right, so what do you do with uh, when you have qualitative Continuous. measures? Continuous. Non-interval. Interval. Oh, interval. Yeah. Interval. Continuous. Yeah. Uh, variables. So apparently, ecologists have come up with this package, which it took me weeks to, to, to dig out. It's called the Hill-Smith method. And it was sort of inspired by this challenge. How do you handle them? And that's the, that's the package where you could find that. And it claims to handle mixed data types. I will sort of be upfront here and say that I didn't find a good documentation. I don't know exactly what goes on behind the black box. I don't know how it, they, I know that they did a translation. They mapped the qualitative data into a continuous space. But how that process was done, I don't understand it. So if you use it, so keep in mind that, you know, that that's, it's something useful to understand and see what kind of assumptions are they making when they are doing that translation. It turned out in our case that when we ran the regular PCA that only used um, continuous data and when we ran this new method, we didn't see a substantial difference. So it didn't, it didn't help uh, so much, but it's something to keep in mind that, that there is this method. But, but in general, right, there is PCA for categorical data. You can do PCA for categorical. Only categorical? Yes, there's what is called the correspondence right. analysis version of this. But if you have mixed data types, then this is the only one that I found that did it. And like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's created by ecologists, tailored to their, to their needs. So, and that's the package where you would find it. Okay. Now, so we talked about this linear PCA. And so let me go back here. And one of the questions that we asked, well, maybe we don't get this nice sharp decrease. You know, maybe we're using the wrong model. Maybe the linear PCA is not the right model to, to, to describe our data. You know? so, so let me illustrate here. Like assume, so this is the nonlinear PCA. That is, the, the new dimension, the principal component, is not linearly related to the original features. You could have polynomials here, there, you could have exponential functions, all kind of fun stuff show up. So here's an illustration. You have this data set that if you were to ignore the tail over there, you would perhaps interpret it to the following way. You would say, there's equal variance along the two dimensions, right? If you were to ignore that small tail. Well, the linear PCA is not going to be able to capture that. It's going to transform it that way. Which and point? when you point to the pure screen. Oh, maybe do that? Do they see that? No, they don't see that. Do they can they even see that? Because the, the camera? No, no, mouse. Use the mouse. Oh, use the mouse. They see the mouse? Yeah. Yes, yeah, see the mouse. Okay. So yeah, so I was referring to this tail here that throws off the analysis. There's something non-linear happening there, and the, the linear PCA is not going to be able to capture it. This is the kind of transformation that the linear PCA would perform, and perhaps a non-linear projection would be best 
and the nonlinear projection would correctly map the space into the sphere where the variance along the two dimensions is equal, which is what intuitively we thought would be the case. Okay, so is this nice and dandy? Sure, let's do nonlinear PCA. And that's what we tried to do in the project. Uh, there is a method called Kern, uh, um, kernel PCA. Um, it's listed in the packages that, that Tanya sent. And I'm not going to run it. I, I, it's built in in R. You could run it. The problem that I had with it, it offers this nice complexity in modeling. But when it came to interpretation, I was saying, I was looking for, oh, now I want to see what are my important features. I want to look at my important features, just like I did with the linear PCA. They don't offer that translation. So they map your, they use this kernel idea, they map your original data into non-dimensional space, and they, non-linear space, sorry, and, and, but, it's, it's this magic trick that happens in, in uh, uh, kernel methods, but they don't they don't do the translation back to your original space, which for our purposes that's what we want to know. I want to know what the what are the original features that are important. So I sorry I ended up um, sort of not going further in that direction. I will say that. Uh, I'm not saying that it's not possible. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that when you use these complex measures, they're, they're perhaps more realistic in modeling, but the other sort of side of the sword there is that they're harder to interpret. And, and perhaps you need to dwell deeper in, into the understanding of how that method works to be able to, uh, to do the interpretation. Uh, issue. Yes. Was the issue that they wouldn't tell you? Um, was the issue that it was very hard to solve for the inverse yes. map? Or was the issue that they wouldn't tell you the forward map at all? Uh, they don't. They don't have good documentation. They, um, in general, the problem is difficult. It's like an open research kind of problem. How do you do the translation back? And and I'm assuming that is. Hmm? Yeah. What I'm asking. Is, when you do this in R, mm -hmm. can you can you get what their forward map was? Can you extract that yes. easily enough? Yes. Not even. So yes. it's just a question of solving for the inverse map, and that's yes. very difficult. Yeah. Okay. And 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 difficult. You know, put quotes around that. I found it difficult. You know, and I did spend considerable time, and I researched on it. But you know, it was not an obvious way. Clearly, they didn't make it. There was no documentation or examples for me but to follow. In general, for kernel methods, I think there are two, the two questions there, right? There is the, did they just not do a good job, and we, you know, were you, with, with what they gave you, were you not able to do it, or is it in general, you know, we so you have a kernel method, both, there are two things, the forward map, explicit forward map, and the, the explicit inverse map. So forward map, to find the optimal fit mm -hmm. is already a problem for kernel. Yeah, because PC. how you do that projection, the kind of kernel yeah. that you use, that's again right. an open research type of question. Right. But even if you find a forward fit, to find the inverse is a hard research, open research question. So, so it's not that Mondo was not smart enough to do it, it's an open research question. And, and so sort of, it's not sort of a dead end. We were able to find, and I will talk a lot about, so I'm sort of a fan of the method. I will talk about random forest which as an alternative to this, for which we do understand better, and which offers us the nonlinear modeling of the data. And there's others, the manifold learning, there's other methods there, but I guess the point that I'm trying to make, whenever you sort of make the model more complex, you have to get ready that the interpretation or the, the assumptions are going to be more complex and the interpretation is going to be harder. So it comes with... I, don't know, I, I feel like this whole uh, discussion about kernel versus linear methods falls into the predictive versus descriptive versus explanatory methods 
I think as, as far as computer science is concerned, the focus is on prediction, so we are all fine with uh, current methods. We don't really know to know why. We only need good predictions. But in this case, we need to find explanations for data because you're working in biology and ecology. We're trying to apply methods to find some explanations and some hypotheses. In that case, a reverse math, reverse engineering, call it as you want, interpretation of the data is extremely important. And there are a lot of methods, I think, and I know a few of them, that don't provide the explanatory uh, modelization in, like, right, right, right there yeah. you to do something. Perfect. I wouldn't have said it any better than that. Thank you. That was Alessandro. That was Alessandro. So you guys are in good hands. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I'm going to move on to partitioning methods, and I will tie this up to nonlinear relations in the data. Okay. Even though sort of the the process is different, and partitioning methods are used for what Alessandro just mentioned, prediction and partitioning of observations now, not feature space, I will tie it up how we can use these methods to actually do feature selection in nonlinear space. And I will start with sort of describing uh, the simplest tree-based method, the, um, the cart method. And so if we look at this space here, so assume that we have, this is our data, uh, and very simple, we have two features, x1 and x2. And so imagine, so this data has been classified. Think of it as two types of sheep, a leader and a follower, right? It's represented by the different symbols. And what we really want is to be able to partition this space in this, you know, this is, this is one part and then the rest is the other kind, right? The other type of um, observation. And clearly, that's not a linear uh, partitioning of the space, right? It's a non-linear partitioning of the space. And what a, a tree algorithm first does is, first, goes through the data, picks a variable, let's say that variable is fi, and considers every value that that variable, take, that variable takes, and then looks for each value x, one all the way to xm, it looks at, it, it, it groups the data according to that value and says, if I were to group the data based on x1, will I get a, a sort of a, a, a concise set of observations or not? So there's this notion, I'm saying concise, and in the tree-based methods is also called, when you get a pure partition, and it looks at this information theoretic concept, the, the entropy concept, that if you have sort of a uniform distribution uh, along the values, you wouldn't expect sort of a lot of information there. You have high entropy. What you're looking for, again, is a discriminative value, a value that would split, would clearly sub separate your data. And so, so here's the process here. You first split it along value S1 for feature X1. Then you go even further because you know you can get even more pure subset of your data. You split it along value S2. And I'm sorry I switched. I just realized I switched notation on you guys. I hate it when my professors do that in class and I just did it. So, so the translation here is X1 here in this plot is the feature and S one through S3, um, those are the values of that feature, right? So we keep splitting, recursively splitting the space until we get the separation. We get the small space belonging to one type and then the bigger space belonging to the other type. And we can represent this recursive partitioning as a tree. So if, if um, the value of the feature is greater than S1, then you get a leader, a sheep that is a leader, if it's greater than, uh, smaller than S1, well then you need to ask, is the second um, feature greater than S2 and so on, until you arrive at another leaf and you can make a classification of the, of the observation. So each, so 
sort of path along this tree represents a rule that tells you something important about the data. And we can use this tree to either classify an, an, objective, uh, an observation, that's the case when the ultimate outcome is a categorical variable, you're interested in saying is it a puller or, or, or a follower, or you could use it to be able to find the value, let's say, as, as a regression tree. Uh, for example, the question would be, if you have measurements um, belonging to a uh, bird nest, you want to predict the value, the position where the nest is. So you would be able to go down along this, this tree and say, oh, if it has these characteristics, if you know the canopy is bigger than a certain value, and you know, it's this type of a bird and so forth, then, you know, it usually positions itself at this height of the tree. So that would be called a regression tree. So the outcome is a continuous, continuous um, variable. So, should we do some, I don't know, how am I doing the time for it? We have an hour more, so. So should I perhaps go through the concepts, or I don't know? Um, I think we'll have uh, to a quick question. What? Yeah. Um, so, so just to clarify, the the goal in the partition is with each partition to maximize the Shannon information um, entropy of the partition. Right. Right. And and is it provable or proven? I I assume that that when you do these partitions in a sequence. So I, you know, I do one partition that maximizes, and then I do another partition to maximize again, and I end up with sort of three rectangles. Are those guaranteed to be the three rectangles that maximize the, 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 the criterion, or could this be some sort of like local optimum that's not actually global? Um, Do you know the answer? Well, I would, if I understand the CART algorithm, I think you do, you do the analysis across all the features and you pick the one that gives you the best information. It's a greedy algorithm. It's right. A, right, so it works, I mean, for Huffman, it's Huffman codes, right? This is right. Your, your compression algorithm. Right. It's, uh, this is what it is. So it's not that you pick, randomly pick a feature at each step and then you split and then so then you would worry about the order. I think you go right, through but, but, all but the I understand I'm going sort of, you know, uphill in this sense as, as fast as I can. At each partition I do the optimal partition to maximize the Shannon information entropy of my partition at that step. Right. And my question is is that is 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 there, you know, some sort of pseudo linearity to the system that ensures that as I do that repeatedly I'll arrive at a global optimum. Uh, Under assumptions of independence of information. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, so there are and then I want to say you're making assumptions that there is separability of yeah. your data. Right. That you could do this linear separations and you see in real data that's that might not always be the case. So, and then the other assumption is that, you know, maximizing the, the, the Shannon entropy is the right way to do it. I mean, there's other ways to, if you could have other objective functions. So, so I want to say, no, it's not, uh, there's, there's no theorem that says, you know, that, that guarantees you're always going to get to the optimum. No, there is, but under the assumptions. Under of, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you make all the nice assumptions, right, there assumptions is separability, there is independence. Uh, right. I mean, what what actually is happening? Uh, this is the computer science students all know this algorithm very well, <laughs> in a very different form, and it's one of those that are typically taught when they taught about greedy algorithms. This is half the code. Essentially. This is. Uh, this is compression. This is this is the most basic compression thing. Let me rephrase what actually is happening. Suppose you have text, right, and you want to use bits of information uh, to encode your text. So you want to use bits to encode your text. How many bits per word? 
So now you're going to compress, right? You have all your all your English text, and each word you're going to encode, each letter, sorry, you're going to encode in, in, in bits. And so what is the most natural thing to do? Just look for repetitions of the So what's the most natural thing to do? You have your text, you have all the letters, you want to code all the letters as, as uh, you want to code all the letters as bits, right? And so, of course, you want to use fewer bits if the letter is very frequent, and you 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 can use more bits if the letter is is, uh, is if the letter is less common. So if you 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 have half of your letters are A's, you only want to use one bit every time you see an A, and if and if uh, you only have one X, you can spend ten bits on that X. So the number of bits is exactly the uh, the Shannon information here, right? It's it's how many, how much information that letter gives you every time it's. And those P J's there yeah. are the the frequencies. the frequencies, right? How many observations have that you know that value? Right. So so that's exactly the the, the, the information that it carries. So so how many observations you have uh, is the P's and log P is. How many bits? So with two. two bits, you can encode four different values, right? With three bits, you can encode eight different values, and so on. So log the number of frequencies tells you how many different, how many bits you need for that fre for letters that have that frequency. So when, and each bit is a new dimension, right? Each time you decide to to use zero or one, it separates the space into two halves. All the observations that have the zeros versus all the ones that have the one. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of data sets, types of data that indeed behave in this nice way that information essentially it corresponds exactly to uh, it corresponds exactly to, to superability. Right? Right. To, 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 yeah. But not all, and so, um, and 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 so so you know under the assumptions of separability, the fact that you can use this one bit and say all the ones on this side are of one kind, only all the other ones on this or the other side are of different kind, is uh, is is the big assumption there. There's also the big assumption of this this binary thing, that binary questions of yes or no, right, the separation on one side or the other is what's informative. So, so there are many, the, many of these assumptions that are made along the way, right, so, so it is this, but the fundamental one is this binary separability that essentially for each dimension it's the two kinds, that the only kinds of questions you can ask here is it greater or less than particular value? But it localized. So, so before we couldn't separate, right? We yeah. couldn't have one linear separator for the whole space. So what this is doing is localizing the sort of is trying to locally do the separation and then hoping that it's going to arrive at this, you know, nonlinear space that we want. And yeah. Right. But you can you can create easily data sets. For example, by embedding. Um, by embedding a box in the middle of the space, where, where or equally equally uh, sided box, right? Where the order in which you're going to ask questions, because you have solutions, optimal solutions for many in, in many, many optimal solutions at each separation point, you're going to come up with many different uh, ways of describing your data set, and not all of them. I mean, and that's an easy question. So it's because you have many optimal solutions along the way you're going to come up with different ways of describing your, your, your data set and so then biologically you need to decide which one of them has actual meaning, mm -hmm. right? Just because computationally we have this optimal solution, you know, that, that doesn't mean that biologically all of them are equally meaningful. The other thing is this is only about the binary separability. Again, meaning, biological meaning is 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 is, uh, is a different thing. So, one of the classic examples of this sort of thing is by is, is medical diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? And, and it assumes hierarchy of questions, and there are many um, 
dead or alive. Mm -hmm. You're right, dead or alive. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Right. Okay. So, so, so optimality of information as measured. This, it's, it's, uh, it's a criterion that first of all is, you can have many optimal solutions along the way. It assumes separability. It assumes information measured in that particular way, and it also assumes it's highly sensitive. The problem with this, this criterion is highly sensitive to um, overfitting, to to overfitting, to undersampling, and to noise and samples. But we, we were scaring them. <laughs> but everything is bad. So you, that's where they come. The, the, the sort of understanding of the assumptions of the method and the assumptions of the data come together, right? I mean, you have to consider both. Right. Okay. Um, I don't mean that cheap, uh, the reactions, but the previous method, I, I, would, I, would, I could see through, you know, seeing the uh, percentage of variance, how you could analyze your variables. And, and here, it seems like more like an access type of thing instead of an analysis. You know, like comparing the with the so code. here I'm trying to reduce sort of the dimensionality of the observations. Before we were reducing the dimensionality of the feature space. Uh -huh. we we're trying to collapse the number of columns, and here we're trying to sort of explain the observation in terms of types or inherent groups in them. And and you know, <coughs> in this case here, we'll have two groups: the triangle and the circle. And you, you arrive into that by doing this recursive partitioning of the space. But, but based on your own assumptions of what to partition. Right, the, the assumptions that we were just talking about. So, so you, st you, ha you have to start somewhere simple and then you build upon it. You, know? you have to do that, otherwise you, you won't be able to say anything meaningful. Like Tanya said, if things are bad out there, so we start somewhere, we start making these assumptions. We realize that those assumptions have implications, but you start somewhere, you understand, and then you start building on them and, and uh, <coughs> hoping to get a, a, a richer uh, method. Than okay. I think I'm going to skip demonstrating this one, and I'm going to... Do you agree? Um, no, I think, you know, because we have kind of 15 minutes, maybe it makes sense to continue next time because you still have to, to talk about clustering too. and everything. Okay. Yeah. So then continue with the R. Yeah. Okay. So we're back to R. library called the R part that contains the um, the tree algorithm. Now we have the data loaded already. I'm just going to run the algorithm, R part. Um, so here I'm going to try to classify the, I'm going to use the same data set, the Iris data set. And here I'm going to try to classify based, so find out the species of the data set based on the other measures. So the way I do that, that's the outcome variable, right? That's the leaf, sort of the, the, the um, category of the leaf node. And I want to describe that outcome in terms of, that's sort of the equal sign, in term, and then that means in terms of everything else, all the other features. And this is the iris data set, and let me store the object. Alright, so it's giving me the, the tree. Let me say plot. Can I plot it? Ah. It doesn't have information on it, so I need to add some text. <coughs> Alright, so so this is what this is the partitioning of the the space for the iris data set. So if the pitot length is less than 2.45, then we could right away say that the kind of flower that it is, is the setosa. 
So remember we were saying with the principal component analysis that the fetal length was one of the most important variables. What? Pedal. Oh, I'm saying it wrong. Pedal length. It's one of the most important variables and it shows up in the node and look how discriminatory it is. It right away you can classify, uh, you can identify one of the types of the flowers. And that value oh. is sort of the, 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 the boundary, the, the separator. I, I, I realize, I think, okay, so here's where the whole uh, optimality comes in. The first variable that separates between everything else, right, it's essentially just a matter of counting. Right. Okay. Right? That, yeah, we, we, we bypassed it. Right. Okay. So it's just a matter of counting what's the most uh, Fre frequent. Um. <laughs> Variable because that's what the algorithm does. Right. It uses frequency as indication of information. The more frequent you are, you know. The, right. You know, the yeah. So 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 a lot of data sets. Yeah, frequency is good, but and and difference in variables. Right. It, the more uh, different kinds of values that variable takes on, that's the that's the more the, the variable that you'll need to spend more. Uh, yes. Sorry. The more frequent the variable is, that the, the the more uh, the first one is going. The more you need to spend, uh, the more you have to use uh, in terms of the more informative it is, and so you need to separate on it first. But it's, it's a very simple measure of yeah of what's what matters for separation. So the idea is to minimize the number of nodes on the tree. The idea is to. When you split based on that variable, the subset of the data that you have, they're going to be pure, very similar to each other in terms of this measure of the entropy. Remember that we have, so I'm saying I'm trying to predict the classification of the flower here. We have the inf information. We can actually go and say we split our data and we have two subsets of the observations based on the petal length. Right? And then we go and say, how pure are the subsets? And how do we find that out? We have information about those subsets. We have a label. We have a, a categorization of those observations. We know what flower they belong to. Right? So if most of them are one kind on one subset and then another kind on the other subset, we have found a very pure separation, a good separation. If there is a mixture, then we have and we need to keep going. We need to further subdivide. Right? Right. So, but what's interesting here that I noticed, this tree has only two levels. Notice that the set of simple uh, characteristics are not playing a role. Remember how we were saying with the PCA that we were not sure <coughs> why the simple characteristics were in the first dimension and perhaps there was an indication that you know, there was some relation there. And according to the, 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 the tree algorithm, you only need to look at the characteristics of the petal. And you are able to classify, you are able to categorize your observations. So, I think that's all I want to say here. Um, Tanya mentioned some issues with overfitting. overfitting so, how long, I mean, we could keep subdividing the space, and we could go all the way to the end when each um, set is one observation. It's a very pure cluster, right? So, but do we really want that? Where should we stop? And why is that important? We get this data set that completely, uh, we get this model, this tree that completely describes the current data set up to the last element, but when we that's not the ultimate goal. We want to take this model and use it in some other data set generated from the, the same underlying population, but it's a new set of observation, and we want to be able to say it generalizes well, it explains it as well. But if it already overfitted, it's not going to perform well uh, with a new data set. So we have to be concerned with overfitting issues, and there's a lot that goes on there. This is sort of another thing of where there's art going on into here, like where where do you truncate your tree? Maybe perhaps you don't need to go all the way at the bottom. You know, you stop somewhere where you see that each step, each time that you subdivide, you're not 
gaining a lot of new information. You're not improving a lot in the purity of the, the subdivisions. But what a lot is, that's always, uh, most of the time a parameter, and it needs to be decided sometimes subjectively. Okay. Um, yeah. I wonder if there is a sort of um, um, hierarchical partitioning, I don't know how you call this, recursive partitioning methods, and instead of using threshold, threshold, so uh, separation along the variables, it looks for a linear separation as a linear combination of the variable. I'm talking about instead of having this sort of result where you have these sort of set rectangles that are oriented. So you could imagine you could a two-step process. You do the PCA first. I was thinking to about find the non-lead, to find those those higher dimensions, and then you do you apply the tree to that new matrix, and that will separate based on those um, linear combinations. I I see, but I'm not sure the two things would be related to the same actually, result. Actually, actually, it's a very common thing to do. PCA, yes, it's like I, the first thing you do, you want to and then you sure the PCA you then get the redundancy. Right? You, want, mm -hmm. you want to do that as a first step. You want to remove redundancy in any way possible. Right? So you do PCA as a, as a first step. Yeah. And then you, you can run into the Yeah. Yeah, now, <laughs> right. The, the, the thing about decision trees, they only partition along uh, lines. Line, along, uh, not I mean, more than lines, there's along there's coordinate okay, parallel yeah. lines. I mean, there are methods, there though, are and methods. you should mention that there are methods that partition not along uh, coordinate parallel. Actually, I'll mention, I'll mention um, well, perhaps I can just quickly show it. And then I'll show, I illustrate clustering, but I'll quickly show where this linear partition will fail. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let me... Okay, so it will fail here. See the donut shape with that? You cannot linearly separate that. You would want, you know, you want a separation from the center and then the around. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but but squaring the circle. Come box. on, I'm going to yeah, square the line. circle. Yes. <laughs> but even uh, usual unsupervised learning clustering algorithm. Would fail here. Yeah, Humans that's what I actually fail. use this for to say that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Humans doesn't algorithm work here. No, no, we, we have to quantify what we mean by fail. Ultimately, I can have a decision tree that oh. will have one point and in each of my leads. If I come and present a second time, I'll show there is this wonderful. You guys should all go to this website. Um, Leland Wilkinson's website. He has this wonderful simulation. And he's basically saying that if you if you just input this to the algorithm, it will it will give you a result. And then I like his expression. It's like it'll chop it up like a monkey, you know. But it'll say these are the clusters. I mean, it's us to to say, you know, this is this is nonsense. You know, this is not good 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 results. I mean, because those algorithms are in the class of Giga algorithms. Garbage in? Oh yeah, that's what he calls a button. He was like garbage in, garbage out. Click that button, and then now cluster. It will it will happily cluster it for you, but it's totally, you know. There are clustering like algorithms that can handle all. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There's um, kernel clustering algorithms. Density based clustering. Manifold learning will try to, you know. And we, we're, we're digressing here, but basically, this... We're digressing into this. Right, right. But this side, yeah, on this, this side, side of yeah. the room. Yeah, but, but basically, that modifies the way you measure distance between da data points. You don't use Euclidean distance uh, anymore. You use some non some kernel function to, to measure distance. And then but then the interpretability of data is still an issue there. Um, because when you use kernels and nonlinear functions, it becomes very, very hard to do the back. Right, right. Yeah, the, the maybe, inverse map. Yeah, right. That's the same issue that we were discussing yeah. before. Right? It's nice to see that there are some common issues on, across all the oh, yeah. methods, and yes. not only here in learning. Yeah. So, actually, I just realized that maybe next time, we should continue next time. We should stop? 
Yeah, we're, we're kind of, it's a good point to stop too, okay. right? Okay. Yeah, so... Um, well, I have to talk about random forest, that's my... No, yeah. not today, not today. No, but well, it's about... Some, it's some no, 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 but hold on, hold on. Hold on. <coughs> you, the random forest is about another five minutes, or... Uh, it's okay. Pr a Princeton guy, they're going to disappear? I think they're probably tired. I can do it next time. Okay, so we'll continue next time. And I just realized... We'll solve, we'll solve everything next time. Yes. <laughs> everything. Yeah. And the answer... Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. The answer is 42. So... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, okay, I'm kind of and, here. And, and say hi to Maria or Jenny or... or who else? Who else? Ipec. 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 yeah. Well, um... Andrew and Albert. Yeah, and if you see them, say hi. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, and Caitlin, so... Caitlin is uh, somewhere doing collecting data. Work, gonna field field work, work, yeah. right. So, we're going to continue next time. And I just realized that perhaps before we continue, I should maybe spend a little bit of time of talking about uh, predictive, descriptive, and uh, explanatory uh, modeling in general. So, before we even, like, uh, run off into this because machine learning in general is about the predictive and descriptive learning. It's very rarely about explanatory modeling. And you guys, well, in general, science scientists are more interested typically in explanatory modeling because the whole point of science is understanding why things are the way they are. Uh, we we're not interested in that. <laughs> so so. Is it that we don't we're not interested, or is it that that's not easy to do without? without understanding yeah, but, but I mean, specific application. Right, but I mean the thing is, and the whole both beauty and frustration of computational approaches to, sci to scientific research is that, you know, trying to use predictive and descriptive techniques to extract explanatory models. So, and, and that's why we need each other, because... <laughs> okay. Or it's like going like this, like, right? No, there is no other way, right? <laughs> well, yeah. So, I should, I so should add something here, except with the exception of visualization, which usually yes. focuses on yeah. wait, discovery wait, wait. and um, explanation of, of facts. Visualization suffers then. of all the things that I just mentioned right now. Well, things. we'll talk about visualization Everything separately. Everything suffered from ev all the things that <laughs> like, you mentioned like so far. Like, if you could solve the donut challenge, right? That's, that's no, but then the humans can sure. do it. You can, draw a, you can draw a donut in 3D and then, oh, this is a donut. Right. And I mean, so, as long as you use your vision to perceive... But humans are also particularly bad at finding patterns everywhere, right? No. Yes. On the contrary, we're very good at finding patterns. Right. I mean, right. We're, we're oh, over finding patterns. Right, right, right. We're, humans are particularly good, let's put it this way, at finding patterns everywhere. So really, we're finding patterns everywhere. Right. Humans, are, humans see patterns in random, in pure random distributions. Right. That's, so, that's so, so we true. still you can't say just let's go the visualization route. You still need that 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 checkpoint of is there actual you know statistical relationship there? Uh, uh, together with visualization, together with domain expertise, together with our intuition, that's when new knowledge can 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 really happen, right? Right. I agree. And the same thing for statistics. Sometimes you can generate nice uh, graphs and charts, yeah. but at the end, if you plot the raw data, it's absolutely all place. And that's going to be the conclusion in my last slide. But what we're saying is, we cannot survive on our own. We, we need each other. Yeah. Oh, we can. <laughs> yeah, we can. We can survive. We just can generate generate knowledge, really. For practical purposes, you know, like yeah. we can abstractly survive. But if you want to, our results to be useful practically, we can.